I'm delighted to share a conversation I had recently with Marsha Shandor of Yes, Yes, Marsha, because it was all about storytelling and using storytelling in an ethically persuasive way to connect with people and close clients. A little bit about Marsha. She is a storytelling and persuasive communication coach and trainer. She has taught thousands of individuals and groups of executives, entrepreneurs, and professionals across the world and has had rave reviews, no surprise here, by clients like Facebook and Royal Bank of Canada, HelloFresh, and Shopify. Before launching Yes, Yes, Marsha and her career as a storytelling coach, she actually spent 15 years working as a radio DJ. Another thing that is not that surprising, even though that's freaking awesome, um, because you can tell that she's just really dynamic and a natural communicator and storyteller. Um, obviously, she gained powerful understanding of how to still tell stories over that 15-year career. Um, her work has been featured in Forbes, BBC, Mashable. And to find out more about her, go to yesyesmarsha.com. Go there just to get inspired by her brand, by how she communicates. And uh, if you go to yesyesmarsha.com backslash no BS, you'll also get a bunch of goodies that she's going to layer on top of each other throughout this conversation. Because every time she came up with a new idea, she said, oh, let me put this on that website too. Okay. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Marsha. Marsha, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Yeah, this has been this has been a long time coming. Months in the making. Oh my gosh, fully present. Can I show you the poster I just wrote down? Based on sure, it's brilliant. She does a daily blog. It's usually Monday to Friday. She doesn't do it every day. It's called the Brass Ring Daily, and it's really short. And it's kind of about creativity and productivity. And she like writes musicals and does other writing stuff. I just wrote this down on a post-it. Solid, Solid incremental progress. Because she said, don't let instant validation be the enemy of solid or like instant validation is never as good as solid incremental pro progress. Mm. Like, that is a good remark because yeah. you're like, oh, but I could put up a post and then I could see how many likes it gets or I could just keep working. I feel like this is going to be my theme for the year. I love that. Somebody gave me a novel that's like five so, inches thick. <laughs> yeah, it's over 900 pages and the writing is tiny. I have to wear special glasses just to be able to read it. But it has a lot of Russian history in it that I want to learn. And then I just thought, what if I just read three pages a day? And I told my friend and she went, by the time you die, you'll have almost finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And isn't that true for anything worth pursuing in life? Just... You know, I just did uh, annual planning with uh, with my program, with, with all of my mm -hmm. students, and it's all about, okay, we can do this big goal, but then let's just break it down to just, what are we just going to do this week? And let's not so feel so, and I think a lot of people, when they think about goal setting, annual planning, they think of it as being this really hard, intense thing, right? Oh, here's my goal. And now I'm going to have to wake up at five o'clock and like do all these crazy things. I'm going to have to meditate for an hour and like whatever it is. And I was like, no, it's the opposite. It's like, get rid of all that stuff. What are just a couple of small mm. incremental things you can do today? And don't even worry about the other stuff because you only have a few hours in a day anyway. Yes. So just do those things, but choose those things at the beginning of the, or choose the big goal at the beginning of the year so that those little things can be clear each day. Yes. It's so good. Solid incremental progress. Sip. I love that. <laughs> sip. Just it's sip it. It's a great acronym. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> It actually well. works though. Yeah, I guess so. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Okay. So you are a storytelling and persuasive communications coach and trainer. You work with both corporate and small businesses. Talk to me about this. Like, wh why do small businesses hire you? Sometimes it's because they're writing like a keynote or a talk, but sometimes it's because they know they need to sell and the idea of doing that makes them want to cry. And so um, part of what I'm doing is using storytelling and what I call ethical persuasion um, to show people that you don't have to do it in a gross way. I think what's, what so often happens for those of us who didn't get well-versed in sales, but then suddenly find ourselves running a business, which by the way was me. I was a radio DJ for 15 years. Everyone sold to me for 15 years. It was wonderful. And then suddenly I started my own business and I was like, oh no, because I thought it meant going around being like, please buy my stuff, everyone hire me. And that, that felt creepy and gross. And what I've realized is it's not that, it's just being like, hey person 
do you have this very specific problem that you were literally complaining about this morning using these words that I'm using right now? Do you have this very specific desire that you think about all the time in, in the frame of reference that I'm using with these words right now? I can solve that problem and get you to that desire. And then people are just like, oh my gosh, yes, please. And then, and that's why I call it ethical. So I call it ethical persuasion because um, it's persuasion, not coercion. You're not tricking anyone into anything. Like if you were, they you wouldn't get repeat business. You know, you want people who like give you good references and enjoy your work. Partly so you don't feel like you have to take a shower afterwards, but also it's just good business sense. And so it's really about thinking about who you're speaking to, thinking about like what's going on for them. And then the storytelling comes in there when it's like, let's tell the story of how their life sucks right now without you in it. And then let's tell the story of how wonderful their life is going to be once they've hired you. And only then do you introduce yourself as the solution. Because anybody who doesn't relate to those pain points, anybody who doesn't relate to that desired outcome is just going to walk away. And that's great. You don't want to work with those people. Okay. So something that I absolutely love about you. So we spent like a magical night together, me and Marsha. So <laughs> Mar <laughs> we met at Laura Belgrave's fabulous party for her book. And then like towards the end of it, I don't remember how we started chatting, but then we went off with a group to a bar and we like closed the bar down. <laughs> and, we were, like, and I should say, we didn't meet until quite a long time after the party was closed. Oh, it was. Like, we it was like after the party. along the street. I think we'd like seen each other and been like, she looks cool, whatever. <laughs> and then we were walking along the street and it was one of those things where within about five seconds, I was like, you're awesome. And then we sat across the table and set the world to rights until they we were. We had like a whole other night together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think what is, um, as you were talking and describing, like what, what you mean by this, and, you know, I can fit it into the way that people teach sales is that nothing about the way that you speak or share feels like the way people speak and share. So when you say, well, you got to talk about, do you have this problem and do you want this solution? And I think automatically, like we've all seen that sales copy, right? Mm -hmm. Are you tired of, <laughs> meh, meh, meh? you know, um, I think of that yeah. friends episode where Joey's like, I can't open the milk, you know? Oh no, <laughs> there must be a better way. Right. And that's like, not, I don't even think that's unethical. It's just stupid. And, and it's just embarrassing. It's, it's Yeah. It doesn't feel good. And I think I also think along the lines of, please buy from me. I think that's the yeah. other part of sales that people are worried about. Like, they don't want to be like, are you sick and tired of doing yeah. this thing? I'm like, I got a but I, but How I do you do key, that? That doesn't sound like that. The key is figuring out what is the exact language they're using. Like really what you want on your, let's say, let's say we're talking about the copy of your website or a sales page or something like that. I think this also, by the way, goes in like any conversation you have with not only any prospect, but like anyone you talk to that might know what prospect. Um, but you want to use the words and phrases they use. Like ideally, you want to use the words and phrases that they, you know, you want to use the words and phrases they complain to their friends about. You want to use the words and phrases they write in their secret diary every night. But really, you want to use the words and phrases that they're saying to themselves when they're freaking the F out at two o'clock in the morning. Um, I know this is the no BS podcast, but I'm just so trained not to swear. <laughs> this is my radio background. Um, <laughs> oh, your radio what, background, what, of course. <laughs> yeah, what you want is like the words and phrases that when you put it on their website, they're like, are you in my house? Like, how did you know? I was just, just saying that this morning. And the way that you do that, like one way to do that is to ask them and listen, but that takes a lot of work. And so what I often do with my clients is we find a situation where you, the person who's trying to sell, can empathize with where they are. So maybe you haven't been in that exact situation, but where can you emotionally empathize with where they are? Like, give me give me a reason somebody would hire one of your clients. Uh, they're embarrassed by their website and they feel like clients are not hiring them because okay. it doesn't look good. So... Think about, so so then think about, so then you kind of dig deeper. Okay, they're embarrassed by their website. They think hi, clients are not hiring them. Um, they're worried about paying the bills. Like, let's dig deeper. Like what, it's always like, why, like I'm always with my clients going, why is that bad? And why is that bad? And why is that bad? And 
uh, by the way, these questions seem easy. They're really hard. If you asked mm. them to me about my business, I'd be like, I don't know, shut up. You're not my real mom. Like, it's really, really <laughs> hard to answer these questions. But you dig in to be like, well, what is the real life consequence of that? Like, often what I'm saying to people is if we were making a documentary about how this person's life sucks right now without you doing the thing that you're going to do, what scenes would we see? Okay, we'd probably see a scene of them like opening a bill and being like, can I pay this bill? Or like, we'd see a scene of them thinking about their mother going, you should get a real job. And then thinking maybe she's right, like whatever it is. And then think about a time when you have felt that way. And then I actually have this whole like visualization process, which you can do by yourself at any time, where you sit down and you imagine being somewhere where you were when you felt the way that your client is feeling and you imagine being there with your eyes closed and you start to ask yourself like what does it physically feel like to be there what does it smell like what does it taste like what does it sound like if I imagined opening my eyes what did it look like and and I'm not talking about like the pinnacle worst moment of your life I'm talking about like a morning sitting at your kitchen table during this period of your life when you were feeling bad in this particular way and then you start asking yourself well how do I feel and where do I feel this in my body and is it hard or soft? Is it moving or still? Side note, all of this comes directly from the therapy that I did with my therapist. I keep telling her she needs to get a cut of this. Um, anyway, so where do you feel it in your body? And then you, and that really gets you right into that place. And then you can ask yourself, what am I thinking? And that's where you get the internal monologues that you're thinking in that moment. And as you dig deeper, like in my experience, almost anytime someone is hire, hiring a service provider, there is shame somewhere. And almost anytime someone's hiring a service provider, one of the internal monologues is what the fuck is wrong with me? Almost always, I would say that's in that. And you don't necessarily want to put that on your website, but and you don't want to leave. But you can. Things, but you can. But what you want, but you don't want to lead with those shamey thoughts, but you kind of start gently and then dig down. And when you can use those deep, deep thoughts that they're having when they're freaking out. Um, it's so powerful. I want to talk about why it's so powerful, but before I do, I want to say like, this doesn't have to be about anything particularly high stakes. People have shamey thoughts about like low stakes stuff all of the time. The shamey thought might be, I'm embarrassed when I look at my website. Ooh, it's so embarrassing. Um, but when you can use, when you can like write those thoughts out, when you can articulate those thoughts and put them on your site, it does so many things for people. Um, if it's the if it's the secret thoughts that they're thinking, it um, it gives you credibility because it says I solve your problem and not not everybody else's, but like I understand yours. It shows that you're going to be gentle with them, and when they come to you and say, "Oh, I don't really know what." what branding I should have you're not going to be like uh why not what's wrong with you like you're going to be careful with them and then it does two really powerful things even if they never buy from you one it gives them hope because it says to them this problem is solvable you are not completely fucked and it has says to them the four most powerful words in the English language which are you are not alone because when we feel like we're not alone we feel like we belong and we crave belonging more than anything else like Maslow's hierarchy of needs it's like food shelter belonging um we crave it more than happiness it lets off all these lovely things in our brain like serotonin to calm us down and dopamine to make us happy and you're telling them they belong not when they've quote unquote fixed themselves but where they are right now because if you have bothered your ass to get this on a sales page to get this on a web page there must be more than one person in the entire universe who feels this way and so you're giving them the thing that they crave most in the entire universe before they've spent a dime on you, which from a service point of view is wonderful. And from a sales and marketing point of view, it's like, whoa, like they have made me feel this good before I've spent any money. What's going to happen if I actually work with them? And so the reason I say all of this is for those people who kind of feel guilty and pushy about selling is like, what if you could write a sales page or have a sales conversation that helps somebody irrespective of whether they buy from you that is a gift not a shove and then that way they're much more likely to because they're not thinking they're not watching you go oh how do I open this milk and thinking oh they're just following the tropes they're being like oh wow this person actually really cares about me because that's how it feels and I felt that way with sales pages from people I haven't bought from like the very first life coach I ever hired was a, a time when I had started my business and I felt like I sat down and got to the end of every day and had achieved nothing and felt like I was such a failure and was doing 50 things. And and I looked at this sales page of this woman who was like, do you get to the end of every day and feel like you've achieved nothing? And I was like, what? Like there's a cure for this? I just was like, Marsh is a loser. 
here's her sentence for the rest of her life. And then, and this woman, I didn't really click with her kind of personality. She's very like, I just say what I mean. And I like super respect those people, but I'm also a bit afraid of them. And, um, and, but through her found another coach, but I just say that as an example of Mm -hmm. like, and then you're going to find your people because the other thing you can do when you're using this human being language is you can put a bit of yourself in there. And again, when you're a service provider, it's kind of important that people like you. Like if you're going to hire like, I don't know, Deloitte or something, some massive agency, it's less, you're probably yourself some massive agency and you don't care that much about whether you like the person. But if you're like a smaller business or you're hiring a smaller business, it's important that you like the person, especially if they're doing your like design and your branding and stuff. I mean, if you don't click with them. And so if you can put your, this is where you can put your personality in. So for me, I like to make a lot of jokes in case that's not clear. And, um, and so it'll be sometimes when you're doing the pain points that you'll be like, maybe you feel this, maybe you'll feel this, maybe you feel this. And the third one will always be something totally ridiculous. You know, maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't be, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be doing this job. Maybe I should get a real job. Maybe I should move to Thailand and become a surf instructor, even though I've never been to Thailand and I don't know how to surf. You know, something that's not a great example. It's not that funny, but you know what I mean? Like that's where you can put <laughs> the little jokes in. Yeah. Um, and and the way to do it, and one, I'm going to make you a secret web page, which is going to be yesyesmarsha.com forward slash no BS. And on there, I'm going to put a sales page template that I have, which is not the only way to write a sales page. It's just a way. Um, but essentially, it's it's you going, are you demographic um, who has problem and wants to get to desired outcome? Then you like massage the problem a little more, not not to poke the wound, but to be like, am I really getting you? Like, is this you? Then you say, do you wish for desired outcome, desired outcome? And only then do you introduce yourself as the solution. Gotcha. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause right here because I'm going to take what you just said and, and this um, amazing sales page template you're going to give us and apply it to the way that we do things because we really don't use sales pages on our websites Mm. at all. We use the website as a way to exactly that. Like, Hey, I am for you. So all of this still applies. Everyone listening, all of this still applies because all of this messaging should be the only messaging on your website. And really our goal is to get people on a call because the service, you know, in you're exactly right in branding and design. It's like this person has to really like you and trust you. And that can't, in my experience anyway, especially at this high ticket stuff, there has to be a two-way conversation for that to happen. Now you can build a lot of trust, but you're not going to hire someone. I wouldn't even want someone to hire me to do their brand until I've spoken to them (laughs) to make sure that they are a perfect fit. So it's like the copy on the website. And by the way, when we say copy on website, that also translates to any copy, right? Like any email you send, any post you make on social media, like everything that you're saying, Marsha, right? Like it applies to any thing you write is going to go through, you want to kind of hit these points. And I guess as I'm listening to you, the part where you said, um, you got to bring you into it is like the most is, is something I'd love to unpack with you because imagine I have a mastery, you know, we've got almost a hundred people in here that are all selling the same thing. Now it's amazing. People think, oh, we're all competitors. And then when you get inside, you're like, oh, literally we're none of us are competitors because we all have our specific personality and our own specific niche. And together, those two things, there is nobody that is, those two are the same. Yes. So if all the pain points are going to be generally the same and all the desires are going to be generally the same, what do we have except us to put into it? And I would love to know from you, like, how do we take it so that everyone's you know, um, copy messaging doesn't say like, and do you just feel like you're a total fuckwad because you didn't do this right? Like if they all say that all of a sudden it'd be, you know, like I said, you could say it. Well, if you said it, you'd probably be on an outlier and that would part be part of your brand, um, (laughs) guilty. So, uh, that might be one way, but how, how do, how does everybody else who doesn't want to do that? How does everybody else bring their story, their personality, and what does it mean to bring your story into this messaging? Since everybody in here is going to be working with a lot of the same general vibes. Um, okay. Three things on that. Yes. One is, um, 
you're not necessarily like everyone's working the same thing, but you're not necessarily targeting the same people. No, definitely. Like, I think that's a good thing to remember because sometimes when we're in these groups, we're like, oh, everyone's doing the same thing. But actually other people don't know that. Like we're in a little bubble and most people are not in that bubble. And so you may be the only person doing what you do that they encounter. That's the first thing. The second thing I think is what we touched on a little bit already is like putting your personality. Like if you're a person who makes a lot of jokes, put in jokes. Like you said the thing of like, are you a fuckwad? I wouldn't do that because I have like people in my audience who there's some things where I'm like I don't want you in my audience if you don't like this like if you're if you don't like my left-leaning politics you probably should step away from me right now right. like if you don't like the fact that I'm queer this is not going to work for us but if you don't like swearing I'm like yeah you can come in so I would never swear on a copy page but for some people they absolutely would because they want to single people out but then the third thing is storytelling and what I love about this and by the way if anyone's like oh, I can't tell stories or I don't have any good stories I've got you, don't worry. Um, because storytelling is this super easy, super low stakes way of getting your personality across. And I wanna be clear, when I say storytelling, I don't mean the story of your life, beginning, middle and end, what's your hero's journey arc. I mean, describe a tiny little moment that happened to you. And so telling a story could be you telling a story about, like I told the story the other day, I was selling something on my email, um, an affiliate thing that this, anyway, this guy, Matt Kimberly did, it's brilliant. Um, and I told this story about going into, so, I have a guilty pleasure. I'm like, really like, don't ever eat in chains. Like every coffee shop I go is, to is independent. But my guilty pleasure is I love to like mindlessly scroll my phone while gorging food in a food court, like in a giant, you know, soulless, not in any way independent food court. So one time I was walking into this um, supermarket and as I walked in, there was a giant sign above that said Dave's Organic Bread. And I was like, okay. And then I walked like two steps further and on the floor, there was a huge decal saying Dave's Organic Killer Bread. And I was like, wow, Dave's is really putting a lot of money into this. And like three steps later, there's another one. I was like, God, who, who is in this marketing department? And I go and get my trashy food and I go and sit down in my food court and I look up and there is, I'm not lying, a 40 foot display in front of me that says Dave's Organic Killer Bread. And I'm like, leave a bit of money for the actual bread marketing department and I sit there and I eat my food and I get to the end of my meal and I walk out of the supermarket and as I'm walking past the till I think I should buy some of that Dave's bread it seems like it's really good and like it the, the signs had told me nothing about how good the bread was it was just the that marketing is really about showing yourself over and over again so that was the that was the message is like you just have to show yourself over and over again now that story the narrative of that story is woman walks into food court sees some signs has a thought like that's not epic there's no hero's journey in there I didn't like they're not going to turn that into a movie um but it's just about this little moment that happened to me and the moment can be even smaller you know and I, and I think this is where you can make yourself likable because you put a little bit of vulnerability in there and again I'm not talking about you being like when my life fell apart and I was going through a divorce I mean like you went to order a coffee and you accidentally asked for a smarte instead of a latte and then you felt like an idiot but then the barista drew a smiley face on your cup and then you knew you were okay that tells me you are not a perfect human which makes me like you more because I'm not going to feel like you're going to judge me for not being a perfect human and if you're a certain kind of person you're like oh that's totally the kind of thing I would do and now I feel close to you and I know a little bit about you so just stories just like these little tiny moments that are just your lenses on the world and I think that's a way because nobody else has your stories you might have the exact same niche as someone else you might have the exact same level of experience you might have the same style but no one else has your stories and that's a way to make you stand out and your story, you actually, so the story was, I went into a store and there was lots of advertising. And by the time I left, I wanted to buy the thing. But yeah. you started the story with, I don't like to eat at chains, right? There's something yeah. I know about you. And I have a guilty pleasure of basically doing yeah. that. <laughs> doing this like trashy thing that's the opposite of what I think to do, which is, that's really like, a, a big chunk of what the purpose of that story was, because now we, we like know a bit about your personality and that part almost had nothing to do with the actual point of the story, but it was an opportunity. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong here. And this is what I'm yeah. hearing. Like that was an opportunity for you to be like, here are a couple things about me and my personality. 
Yes, an opportunity for me to put in my personality and also a way to make you slightly interested in me walking into a supermarket because it's like, if I'm just like, one time I was walking into this supermarket and I saw a right. sign, you'd be like, oh, where are we going with this? Um, another way to do that. So, so when I talk about storytelling, and I know there are a lot of brilliant storytelling teachers who talk about like this structure and that's that structure and the other structure. Um, I find that hard because I find it hard to like put my life into those structures. I, I think find that's that important hard too. I think if yeah. you're telling a 10 minute performative story on stage, a show like The Moth, absolutely you need some structure. But if you're using storytelling in copy, like on, on a social media post, anything like that, all you need is an action scene. So when you're telling a story, you're making a movie inside your listener's brain. So if you think about movies, most movies are mostly made up of action scenes. They have a bit of montage, they have a bit of voiceover, but it's mostly action scenes. And so um, action scenes is like everything is happening in real time, all from the perspective of one or a couple of the characters. And so you want your stories to be like that as well, rather than saying like, oh, I went to Alaska and I met these two scientists who were really cool. And I went to three parties and I saw two different kinds of wildlife. And you'd be like, okay. Um, it's saying, you know, I, I step outside, it's 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. And as the sun hits my face, I feel this excitement in the pit of my belly. I put my hand in my pocket. Money is there. This is going to happen. And that's about me going to the corner store to buy a bag of chips. Like, it's not about the story that you're telling. It's about how you tell it. And the way to write those action scenes is, one, to get somewhat granular. You don't need to tell every single detail, but just give us a vague sense of where you are. But two, ask yourself these two questions over and over again. What did it look like? And how did I feel? So what did it look like is like anything sensory, you know, what did it smell like? What did it sound like? Are you standing alone in your bedroom or are you standing with 500 people in a giant conference room? Like just give us the vague sense that we need to make that picture. And then the most important one is how did I feel? How did I feel? How did I feel? Because that is what's going to draw us into the story. Even me saying the thing about guilty pleasures and food courts is like a way of putting emotion into I'm walking into a supermarket because you know that I feel a little bit conflicted about being there. Like I kind of feel like a bad person, but I'm also quite excited because I get to do my food court thing. Um, and, and the reason that emotion is so important is that it gives us the stakes. It tells us whether or not to care about the story. You know, I, I wrote my name, you know, I gave gave my gave my order wrong and the Boris, you know, in, in the coffee shop and I felt stupid. It's like, okay, now we know, now the stakes are high. Oh, what's going to happen with the barista? And then they do a smiley face and we're like, oh, now we're relieved because we know that that barista doesn't think we're an idiot. Um, it draws us in. It's also how we relate to any story because we haven't been in every situation. Like maybe you've never gone into a coffee shop and asked for a smarty instead of a latte, but you know how it feels to do something and then feel stupid and to kind of sit in that tension until it's released. Um, and so, so the maybe feeling is making it relatable. If the, the feeling, yes, yeah. the sensory details sometimes make it relatable, but really the emotion is what makes it relatable. And that's often where the vulnerability comes in, because unless your emotion in every story is great because my life is perfect all of the time, usually there's a bit of vulnerability in emotion, even if it's positive emotion. Like if you're super excited because some dorky thing happened, like that's a little bit of vulnerability in there. But it's just giving a little moment where you have the emotion in there. And I think this also goes for when you're telling stories about clients. Like if you're trying to say to um, a new client, well, a lot of my clients do this or a lot of my clients do that. You can just give them the example or you can give them the little story. You can say, well, I did have this one client who was really nervous about his branding because he felt like it needed to look good in front of corporates. And then we did X, Y, Z. And then actually when we rolled it out, he was getting these incredible compliments. And so then from them, we can assume that he was having a good emotion. Um, that I think often if you can talk about, you know, we talk about those before and after stories, the story of how their life sucks before they hire you and how their life is wonderful afterwards, you can throw a little bit of emotion into that, even if you're talking about other people. Mm, I love that. These are these are skills that you obviously hone over time to even be able to pull these great little tidbits out. Like how do you, how do people who don't know how to, how do people who don't talk like this, don't think like this, don't communicate like this start? You had those two questions. What did it look like? What did it, how did it how, feel? What did it look like and how did you feel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, literally like practice and practice uh -huh. in low stakes way like practice yeah. on your friends practice facebook is such a great low stakes way to practice you can just like post a picture and be like the other day i saw a dog and i felt nervous because i thought it might bite me 
but then it licked my hand and I felt better and just be like, how do people respond to that? And it's really, it's, I feel like when you're starting out, it's about quantity rather than quality. It's about doing this as often as you can. The other thing is like observe, become a scientist, have like a tiny scientist in your brain at all times when you hear stories or anything that looks vaguely like a story. And usually the way you know it's a story is like, is it describing a thing that happened? Um, if so, it's a story and see like, what do you like about stories? What don't you like about stories? I found almost always when I don't like a story, it's either because they're doing voiceover instead of action scene. They're just telling me all the top line things without describing any scenes or because there's no emotion in there. And it's really hard for me to care about a story when there's no emotion in there or the emotion is just like, everything's great because I'm so cool all of the time. So start to notice what you don't like about stories, what you do like about stories, like poke around. I mean, the advantage of like having a lot of other people who are doing what you do is you can start looking around their websites and being like, okay, who has a website I really like? And it doesn't have to be in your industry. It can be anything, but just be like, you mentioned Laura Bell Gray earlier. I feel like she is the gold standard for telling stories to sell like get on her mailing list talkingshrimp.com is her website because she sends out emails like i i you i will read her emails instead of scrolling facebook if i need a little break because it's just a cute little story and then i end up buying things from her that i never meant to buy because after a while i'm like oh, i did need that um but it's also she just is so good at taking a story where almost nothing happened and making it completely entertaining. And so I think it's studying. I mentioned The Moth earlier. There's a, so The Moth is a live show that's kind of across the US, which is a storytelling show. They have a great podcast and a radio show. It's free. This American Life is like another place that tells a lot of stories. I found The Moth through them. I run a storytelling show. I should plug my own show before someone else's. I run a storytelling show called True Stories Told Live Toronto. We have about a hundred stories up on, on um Is it a podcast? YouTube. Uh, so it's not, a. it has been a podcast at points. I think you can probably find it somewhere. But if you go to YouTube True, and type in True Stories Toronto, it shows up. So those are 10 minute long performative stories. But again, you can listen. I've coached almost all the stories on there. And so you can hear my style in there. You can hear the, what did it look like? You can hear the, how did it, how did you feel? Um, and just start noticing, like, what do you like and what don't you like? Um, when I first got into the moth, it was long before I started my show. Um, and I, at the time, this shows you how long ago it was. You had to buy CDs if you wanted to listen to CDs. I think it's before they had the, before they had a podcast and you could only buy 10 CDs at a time. And I like went to a show, I was living in London, but I visited New York. I went to a show and I bought 10 CDs. And then I just spent two months sitting on the tube in London. And on the tube in London, you have to understand, this is the subway, uh, nobody talks to each other. Like you do not, if something weird happens, you might briefly make eye contact with someone, but probably not because they could be a murderer. So nobody talks to each other. And I would sit in these packed tubes, sometimes bur bursting out laughing, but more often than not, just going, <gasps> and clapping my hand to my mouth because something terrifying had happened on the story because the stories are also gripping but yeah listen to stories and just start to observe like where do you see stories out in the wild which ones do you like why do you like them which ones don't I just feel like you learn more from things that you don't like which ones don't you like and why don't you like them is it because it was voiceover is it because it didn't have emotion in it is oh, it because yeah. it went on too long? You're making me think of certain people in my life who it's just top line. There's no mm. stakes. It's just this happened, this happened. And you get to the end and you're like, why did you tell us that? <laughs> like, yeah. No, no purpose. And that is the difference between like enjoyable conversation. Yes. Really. Okay. This is so, so juicy. Okay. Question. Some of what you're saying is obviously evoking ideas of fully flushed out stories. I mean, a 10 minute mm -hmm. story, obviously, or, or Laura Bell Gray's uh, emails. Like she will talk about something that happened and the email will go on for a few paragraphs before she gets to the, you know, and that's why you should buy this thing that I have. Mm -hmm. she, she sells in almost every email. It's amazing. Cause it doesn't feel like it. You really yeah, should sign up for her emails. Yeah. And, and honestly, when I'm, when I need to get into the creative writing mood for an email or something, I just pull up some of her emails just to re yes. re remind myself that, oh, right. Don't just start with the stupid whatever, like the, our default, I call it default thinking, right? Like level one, Hey, are you having this problem? Like that's level one. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, now let's go with, okay. So this, you know, bird flew into my window and it totally freaked me out. Let me tell you. And then, okay, let me tell you what happened. Um, and can I tell you the third, the yeah. other mistake that oh, people yes. make is they start, is they start telling you this, like, 
rambling, not deep story about what they've been up to. My old sales coach, Kendrick Show, who like changed my life, um, used to, she's from the deep south and she would do this thing where she, where she was talking about email lists and she was like, oh, you went on holiday to Florida with your family? I don't care. She's just like, oh, your dog is sick right now? I don't care. Yeah. Like if you're, if you are doing any kind of copy, if you're doing email copy or social media copy, like jump right into the story. Oh, Don't I'm so glad you that. said that because every time somebody posts an email, everyone does it. Everyone, Cause I'll have people post in our program. Like, you know, if you're going to send something out, let us see it. We can give you, and it's always like, mm. Hey, hope you had a nice holiday. I'm like, ah, <laughs> like we <laughs> didn't have now have yeah. Kendrick show up in your head going, ah. Don't care. I don't care. Right. Like, why <laughs> should they care? And I think of that as like the most valuable real estate is that yes, first yes, sentence. Yes. So don't waste it. Yes. Right. I actually, it. I got that from a um a speaking coach who said every person gets on stage and says, Hi, my name is Pia and I'm from and it's like, oh, you just lost him. Mm. He's like, no, mm. come out and be like, I had this uh I did a uh, a talk with somebody who but he's a teacher. He's a professor. He said he starts every semester by walking in the room and picking up a chair and throwing it against the wall. <laughs> That's how he starts every semester. I mean, wow. what an opener. Wow. Right? Yeah. I mean, I want to do, I told my my other friend who's uh, a, a professor or she's becoming a professor and she was like, I can't do that. I'm like, well, <laughs> would really change things for you. <laughs> you could just like pick up a jello and slide it onto the table. Or <laughs> I mean, literally the whole experience for the semester will be different if you start it with that versus, okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, okay. So, so yeah. Jonathan on. Fields from Good Life Project calls that a pattern arrest. Mm. Um, and so, which, which I, in my, I, I call it like story song, stop, arrive on a horse. Like it's just something. One of my clients started her keynote in front of 600 people walking out, singing help by the Beatles with her guitar and making the audience join in. Like what an opener that you're just like, what you want something. And it's the same, even when you're even within the story, you want something that's going to pull people in. We had a story at my show recently. I coached her, um, Sabrina Sundari, but I have to actually give her almost full credit for this. The story starts with her. So it was during our Halloween show. So it was a ghost story. And she says, you know, I'm standing outside the elevator in this big lobby in Toronto, holding my coffee and feeling nervous because I really want this job. Um, you know, I'm going up to my interview on the fifth floor. When the elevator doors open, this man runs out, then turns back to me and says, uh, as I get into the elevator and says, don't stop until you reach the ninth floor. No other floor is safe. And we're all like, <laughs> like how's, how's she going to get to the um interview why is no other floor safe who is this man so many things even there's a book by um Charles Duhigg called um the the power of habit and I bought this book yeah. and it sat on my bookshelf for a year because I was like oh a book about habits Snoresville what I didn't realize is that he is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist um the first sentence of the introduction to the book is she was the experimenter's favorite participant Straight away, you're like, okay, why was she the favorite? What are the experiments they're doing? <laughs> it pulls you right in. So so jump right into your emails and jump right into your stories as well. Yes. And no matter where you are sharing these, speaking to somebody in an email, on your website, on a social media post, I think people feel uncomfortable jumping right in. I mean, well, I, I do. sometimes it's do. Weird. Why is it uncomfortable? Because that's not how we talk when we're talking to our friends. So context by its nature has to be like voiceover and montage because you have to cover a lot of ground in a small period of time. And when we're having coffee with our friends, we're like, oh my gosh, about five years ago, I worked in this job and I had this boss who I really didn't like. He always used to do blah, blah. Anyway, one day I came in, blah, blah. That's how we talk when we're having conversations because we have a lot more bandwidth to sit and listen through that. We're not going to be like 20 seconds, I'm bored and walk out of the coffee. Like we're going to sit there and actually listen. Whereas when you're, it's performative, when you're on social media, when you're doing a presentation, it's performative. When you're writing email copy or, or web copy, it's performative. And there's a lot of competition. People could click away or move away at any time. Even if you're doing a talk and you have a captive audience, I always say the first 30 seconds of your talk is the most important part 
because that's where people decide, am I going to listen or am I going to sit here, make my face look like I'm listening, but in my head, I'm wondering what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. And so it feels weird because it's not what we naturally do in conversation, but social media is not natural conversation as we know by all the fights we have on it. And so I think it's really, it, it's important to just get comfortable with the discomfort of that. And then it'll start, once you start getting responses from people, you'll be like, oh, this feels pretty good. What about um, this in-between communication, which is a which is a reach out to somebody that you know, but it's a personal reach out, but it is something you want to get attention. Do you feel like it turns it into feeling like it can be salesy if you don't start? Because I've noticed this because I, I edit lots of people's emails where I'm like, don't say, hey, hope you're doing well to start this email. But I know that they get really uncomfortable because they're like, well, I'm sending an email directly to this person. And it feels like you have to say that in order to get into the email or else it feels like it's a sales pitch when really all I'm trying to do is connect with this person and, you know, Mm -hmm. reconnect with them what is your I and know so it's a very you, specific yeah. context no 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 what do you um, suggest they do instead uh I suggest they jump right into um if you're feeling this I want to talk to you or like something about like hey uh and and I try to always remind them to to use as much you and as little I as possible because I mean it's not a rule but if you go through an email it's like I this because the natural tendency is I have a new thing that I think would be good for you. And it's like, mm, I'm not interested in your thing. <laughs> I'm interested in what you have for like why I'm struggling or like what I could use help with. So um, I don't have a, like, a, I don't have a specific way to do it because I think it does need to be organically for you. But I, I do think that you want to jump into you and what they're either feeling or struggling with, or, or you might be the exact person I'm looking for. You know, so I'm just curious. Uh, so I would, I would say I'm not averse to a little bit of social lubricant, like a little bit of like, hey, hope you had a nice Christmas. Like as long as you don't spend a super long time on it, and as long and as long as before you finish that paragraph, you say something that will pull them in. Like I have a quick question for you, because then they'll be like, oh, what's the question? As humans, we hate an information gap. An information gap is like. You know, those Buzzfeed headlines that say like 12 weird things dogs did. You'll never believe number three and you click on it, even if oh my you do dogs or weird things. So as humans, we hate an information gap. We're desperate to close it. We also love it. It floods our brain with dopamine and oxytocin. And so if you say, you know, hey, hope you had some nice holidays. I've got a quick question for you. Then they're going to jump to the next paradox. They want to know what the question is. Um, the other thing that I recommend doing sometimes for your first little paragraph is spending like five minutes Googling them and seeing if yes. there's anything about them you can say to just be like, hey, I saw your company just won this award. That's so cool. Or refer the last back to the last conversation you had with them. So it might be like, hey, I just was. So this is the one thing where I think it's OK to be a little bit fake, to be okay. like, hey, I was just thinking of you yesterday. I remember when we talked about blah, blah. Um, you know, oh, but it is an like art that for that not to feel fake because I get those emails all yeah. the time. But about tell me, people tell me what a bad one looks like. Um, well, I get a pitch to be on this podcast a couple times a week and it's always, um, Hey, I was just listening to your episode about this, 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 I loved how you, this, this, this anyway, I think you should have my friend, my person who's, you know, totally irrelevant to your podcast as a guest <laughs> and you're like question though do you prefer those to the ones who've clearly not listened to any at all I I guess when I read that I don't believe they actually listened oh, to it or oh, cared I, okay. it looks like okay so you went to my podcast you listened to an episode so you could write this intro paragraph and the reason I don't it's the reason I know that is because I guess this is part of it though and this is more depends on who you're pitching because inherent in the in the ask is that you didn't listen to it right. because you're pitching me someone that is not a fit. Yeah. If you listened to it, you would know this person is not a fit. So I don't know. That's the I, one I get the most. So that's why so it's top of mind. I had a thing recently where a guy pitched me and he made a video of like him. It was like a it was like a Canva of my not a Canva, yeah. but when they do like a yeah. little like loom, a loom of your yeah. website. And I'll watch those. Yeah. And he was like, but he was like, hey, really like your website. Storytelling, great. Praise and testimonials, love it. <laughs> You're just reading the tabs. 
Right. You're just reading the tabs. You haven't actually. And so I think it's saying something that shows that you've listened, but you can listen to five minutes of that podcast, but be like, oh, I love what, you know, Marsha said about storytelling. I'm going to try that the next time I speak to a client. Right. Like how, like apply it you to gotta a, go deeper. I, I call this the you transformed me compliment that we all, you know, I think what we all really want as humans is one, we want to feel truly seen and heard and understood. And that's to feel like we belong. And the other is to feel like we've been of service. Like we've made a difference to the world. And so mm -hmm. when you can say to someone, you, you did this thing and it made a difference to me and it can be a tiny thing. I remember pitching this woman who I knew had got, it was on um, the, there was some website where you, where they would like throw up pitches and then they would get like a thousand people pitching them. And I read one blog she wrote about putting a pot plant on your desk. And I said, oh, I love that blog. I've now put a pot plant on my desk. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Here I am pitching myself. And she wrote back to me immediately because I basically was like, hey, you made my life better. So rather than just like, oh, I loved what Marsha said about storytelling. It's saying, I loved what Marsha said about storytelling. The next time I'm in a, you know, writing piece of doing a social media post, I'm going to try and tell a story or like, or even just like, I'm going to think about that every time. I hear somebody tell a story like it can be a tiny, tiny shift or or ideally, I I mean, I feel like there is actually your pot plant story actually is like a couple levels above. I'm going to do that next time, because mm. to me hearing I mean, I'm just listening to you do these two things to me. You I did something I did that yeah, was powerful huge. is but like can, more yeah. right. For yeah. sure. But you can even be like, I'm never going to look at bananas in the same way. Again. Right, like right, right. It can just That's... be a tiny thing. You're basically yeah, yeah, saying yeah. you changed my life. And here's I the love advantage of a having a paragraph like that is it can help you with the subject line. Okay. So I used to teach networking and I made a whole video about subject lines. I have like nine different costume changes in it. I'm going to link it on the secret Oh, website. please link it. But essentially the subject line, you want the whole purpose of the subject line is to just pull them in. Like I talk in the video about how like no one's going to make out with you because you wore the great dress to the club, but they might start talking to you. And so you, the subject line is a way to pull them in. And so my favorite subject line um, framework is factual slash mystery. And so factual might be the actual thing that you're messaging them about. And mystery is creating that information gap. So say, you know, you talked on the podcast to someone who, I don't know, halfway through discovered that bananas look like, and oh no, that's too rude. Um, halfway through <laughs> discovered that a mango really looks like a cat or something. I don't know, this is a terrible example, but, but go with it. And then you might be like, the factual might be like, um, question, uh, question about your website slash cat mangoes or just something and you and it right. and it can be something you lightly touch on in the email you just right. want to make sure you mention it at least once but a non sequitur so creates but the gap. Non sequitur, yeah, something weird. But also, I think a quick question is a good non sequitur. It's like a good information gap. Sorry, not non sequitur, but a quick. Yeah. When somebody's like a quick question, even when I know they're pitching me, I'm often like, oh, but what's the question? And so then I'll <laughs> open the email. And if then in that email it's saying the quick question, do you have pain point, pain point, pain point? Do you wish for desired outcome, desired outcome? And, and the answer is yes, then they're much more likely to want to have a conversation with you. I love One that. more thing I wanted to say about yes. like going way back to the whole thing of like the pain point and the desired outcome is that's not just for web copy. I think that's so important in consults. When I have a consult with someone, I will speak at the end for maybe five or 10 minutes, but I try and make the first, however long I'm on the phone with them. So it's a 30 minute one. I try and make 20 minutes, just me pulling out the pain points, pulling out the pain points, pulling out the pain points, and then pulling out some desired outcomes. And so then when I'm writing a proposal, I am literally transcribing the words that they said and putting it in there. And I cannot tell you how often I have had clients from one-on-one -on -one to big corporate companies saying, I feel like you really understand our company. And I'm like, no, you understand your company and I transcribed your words. <laughs> but it's like I do to some extent because I was able to transcribe them. And so, and one of the things I've started doing is in proposals, I have the engagement overview at the beginning. And that's basically me regurgitating everything they told me about what the problems are and then introducing myself as the solution. But I've started writing them a little bit more like sales pages. I've started kind of telling a little story at the beginning of being like, okay, your company has done very well for this and this and this, but really how did that happen? Through word of mouth. And how is word of mouth translated? Stories, boom, introduce me. Like it's just, 
I think it's okay to start doing that stuff. And proposals are mostly so boring. So when you can mm-hmm. put a little bit of color in there and, and totally. for me, I don't have any design skills, so I have to do it all with my words. Then I think I it's love, so yeah. I love that you said that. So we don't do proposals. We do mm-hmm. the paid lead product. And exactly what you just said is what we write in that lead product. So I want everybody who's mm-hmm. listening to hear what Marsha just said, that we are taking their words. You want, we have the first part is current situation. We want those words to be what they said. That's how they feel that you understand them is by their words. And then you put your, you know, beautiful, I, I haven't thought, I, I think they're, in the lead product brief, which is essentially a paid proposal, but much more than that, it's, it's more strategy. We are saying, you know, here's the prop, you know, here's what you said, but this is the problem and here's the solution. And then here's the strategy, right? Here's what we suggest. Um, and that's what we're going to do. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, I have to think about this because you just made me think of it, uh, how story details can be put in. I usually tell them, paint a picture. I want, I want, as they're reading this plan, I want them to see as I tell them, no design, just words. I want them to imagine and visualize what this could look like because if you paint that picture for them, then you're the only person that can do it because you created the vision of it. And how could they yes. go to somebody else to create, to paint the painting you just described when clearly you're the one who has the vision? Um, and I wonder if that counts as story. <laughs> Well, I'm, I might be off here, but my instinct is you put emotion in that. You talk about not just what is the website going to look like or the branding, but what's going to happen then and what's going to happen then. And like, yes. what are the other possible things, you know, and you can even do it in a kind of theoretical way of being like, have a website that makes even your old, you know, auntie yes. dots say, oh, I really enjoyed your website. You know, have a website that you are proud to send out to clients, like yes. have branding that you love so much, you get a t-shirt made of it and you wear it when you're not at work. Like something like that. Again, it's action scene, action scene, action scene, right? As a side note, this worked everywhere. A friend of mine recently came to stay and we were talking about his dating profile and he's like, oh, I worry I come across as really intense. And then he showed it to me and I was like, oh dude, you come across as so intense. (laughs) And what we did was we just switched it all for action scenes. Instead of him saying, I'm looking for this, this and this, he said, so for example, it was like, you know it said something like what what do you want out of a relationship and instead of him being like for us to be close vulnerability honesty he just wrote you and I sitting on opposite ends of the couch reading with our legs entwined and it's like boom I know you just just gave me like chills (laughs) (laughs) and um and then he messaged me and he was like you've got to be a date ago he got like three dates that way (laughs) but it's just all little stories you know and again with stories I don't mean beginning middle and an end I just mean action scene like that's just a little scene I paint drop in drop in like scene 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 whenever you can tiny little action scenes because they activate completely different parts of our brains and also they activate our emotions like you just had this really strong emotion to that scene and I didn't tell you anything about those two people I didn't tell you anything about the emotions they were feeling but you had an emotional response and as humans we like to think we're so rational but we base our decisions on our emotions specifically a part of our brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that if you were to kind of drill behind your eyes about two inches it's in there and it's where we hold the memory of emotion so when we're making a decision we're asking ourselves will this make me feel more comfortable in the future and so that's what your clients are asking themselves and so if you can paint a picture of their lovely comfortable nice future then that helps them close that gap like that helps them jump over that line to be like oh it will make me more comfortable in the future therefore I will say yes Mm. Oh my God. So many gems. Anyone who's listening to this is going to have to re-listen to this three times just to get all the beautiful gems. Um, Marsha, I feel like you and I could just chat forever because that's what forever. we did when we met. And we were like, I think it, they closed it down and they were like mopping and they were like, you guys really need to go. And we were like, oh, okay, sorry. And then we stood at the top of the stairs at the subway for 20 minutes. We were like on the subway for a really long time in the middle of the night. Um, so don't be a stranger. I have more things I want uh, to ask you, uh, about. So, um, first of all, I said, we said it throughout, I said in the beginning, but I'll say it again. Yes. Yes. Marsha, which by the way, I've also shared that with quite a few people. It's just an amazing uh-huh. example of like owning your name, but also branding it and getting a, I'm sure Marsha.com wasn't available. I don't know if that's how part of how it came to be, but I was like no, trying to give people yeah. URLs. <laughs> how did that come it's to such- be? Oh God, it's so, I need to make up a really great story about this. Basically, <laughs> Marsha.com was taken 
um my last name Shanda it's like it's hard to spell um and I wanted to I knew that my business was going to change so I didn't want something that was like networking is easy and fun dot com right. um and then I did this exercise I was in this program B school Marie Folio's program and she got us to do an exercise right at the beginning where we had to ask 25 people what our strongest quality is so they had to write our three best qualities which by the way is an exercise every human alive should do it's so good and so my number one one was kindness um, but I didn't think that was that good for branding um, <laughs> and my number two one was positivity and so I just tried and oh, and also because Hello Marsha was taken and Hi Marsha, when you write it out, looks like him, arse, ha. And so I didn't want that. And um, and so yes, Marsha was taken on Twitter by somebody's tribute to their dead friend. And I was like, oh, I can't do that then. So I put in yes, yes, Marsha. It's the best thing that's it's ever. It's so happened. good. <laughs> it in it, it in it, it it says it just it is so you because. Yes, positivity, but I also feel like the yes, yes is it's like this silly. energy. Yes. It's silly. It's energetic. It's the second you meet you, you get that vibe. And I was like, of course it's yes, yes, Marsh. <laughs> and I told I one of my good so friends much. just after I'd done it and he looked at me and went, it sounds like someone's having sex with you. And I was like, they're clearly having a great time. I don't have an issue with that. I think that's a great story, Marsha. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should take that one on the road. Um, it is so, so good. Yeah. So I like share with people as a great example of also being creative. I just shared it with somebody because he was like, this URL is taken and this URL is taken and I'm going to put a .net and a dash. And I was like, no, oh. you need a .com and look at all the creative things you can do. But also your website is just um, great copy, great uh, inspiration. Um, you're going to make it at yesyesmarsha.com backslash no BS, not knobs, but you can remember it however you want. And, uh, and, and you're going to put all those links in it. Did you write yes. them down? Okay. Yes. Cause I, and I'm gonna put I the... wanted to see that video yeah. you said you would link. Oh yes. The subject lines video. I'm going to put in the sales page template, which again could work as a homepage yes. template. And I'm going to put in there four questions to ask yourself before you write that sales page, which will basically so the sales page template is literally like fill in the gaps mm -hmm. and the questions will give you the answers with which to fill in the gaps. Can I say one more thing on that? That when we're talking about the pain point, when we're talking about the desired outcome, there is a version of answering the question, what do you do? That is, I work with demographic who have pain points. Mm -hmm. I do thing I do to get them to desired outcome. And if you can find a way to answer that sentence... Um, using that framework, then A, it means that when you answer the question, what do you do at a party, you will get clients because people will be like, oh my God, my sister was just saying that yesterday. But B, it's like the foundation for any marketing you do. Like if you're like, should I launch a podcast? Well, do those people listen to podcasts? Let me think about it. Should I, what should I post on social media? Am I addressing a pain point? Am I addressing a desired outcome? Something to do with that. Like what kind of story should I tell within a story? What elements should I pull out? Let's pull out the ones that have pain points. Let's pull out like the pain point stories, by the way, are the ones that are going to be like, you are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone to your clients, especially if they then get to the desired outcome. It's like, and there is a route out of this. And here are some people that have already done on that and so I'm going to stick that I don't think I, I need to put it in like a pdf or something but I'm just going to write that formula on to the okay. yes yes marsha.com forward slash no bs so that you can see it because I think it's the foundation for all marketing and sales in your business if you can get clear on that I love that and can I ask you um actually now that you brought that up that you know, that sentence, right? I help, you know, with pain point outcome, right? I feel like there's different levels to making that interesting. And then there, and there becomes this challenge at a certain point where to make it interesting might lack clarity. And I don't I'm think curious it needs to be interesting. I don't think it needs to be interesting. I'm always like clarity over style when you're so. like when you're trying to create function always like it's the same as like the tabs on your website you don't want them to be right. like whizzy bangs or something you want to be like <laughs> praise and testimonials examples <laughs> of my work um but I think there's like a cute way you can answer things when you're in a situation it's more about having that sentence you don't have to use it like that every time mm. maybe you just use a bit I work with demographic I solve pain point. I get people to desired outcome. Like the most important of those four things are the pain point and the desired outcome. We often think the most important is the thing that we do. It's the thing people care about the least. Unless you are one of two dentists in a small town, nobody cares how you do what you do. All they care about is do you solve my problem and where do you get me to? Um, and you can find a cute way of doing it. Like when people ask me what I do, 
in most, like, unless I'm in a work situation where I think I might definitely get clients, I usually say I help people tell stories because then people are like, uh, and then I'll say I work with companies to be more persuasive through, I'll say to be more like ethically persuasive through telling stories or individuals. I help them write keynotes and put their personality into their business. You're so good, Marsha. I love it so much. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing all of this gold. Um, I have so much more to ask you and we'll just do it again. How about that? <laughs> Let's just do it again. Let's just do it again. Okay. Thanks. Future.